My name is Phil Jeska from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I have a show here at the Ocean City Arts Center of my models. Can you read? What's that say on the top? Phil Jeska, customer art models. Are you really smart? Yes. I think you are. What did you like most? Uh, the Woodhaven Diner. Oh, why? Because I'm in it. <laughs> I think this young lady explains perfectly why people are so crazy about Phil Jeska's architectural models. It's because he puts us and our dearest memories into his art. I live in Ocean City, New Jersey, where many people form memories that last a lifetime. My name is Doug, I'm the owner of Reddy's. And what do you think about Phil's model of your restaurant? What an amazing job he did. It's something that he should be very proud of, and I'm very proud that he made the model of Reddy's. Looks like some pretty good potatoes over there. Oh, yes. <laughs> When I was asked to do this show, I wanted to include a number of Ocean City establishments. Right away, people suggested doing Reddy's. It's been on 8th Street, right off Asbury Avenue, probably 50 plus years. Mr. and Mrs. Reddy started Reddy's in 1962. The building itself was built by the city of Ocean City. It was council chambers upstairs. We were a switchboard system for many years. And then over the years, it was different restaurants. And in 1962, Mr. and Mrs. Reddy bought it turned it into Reddy's Coffee Shop. I am the fourth generation after the Reddy's to take over Reddy's, and that was nine years ago. From what people tell me, it looked exactly the same. It's never been changed. The reason why it stays the same is because there is nothing to reinvent here. This works, people like the charm. They like to know to come back year after year after year that it's gonna be the same, the same help, the same everything. It's just a great place to come to. When I posted some pictures of this on Facebook, one of the longtime regulars panicked and thought that the owner had refurbished the interior. And I assured him, no, it's just a model because <laughs> it looks so shiny and new. Doug Wing, the owner, is a real fan of diners himself. He likes all the old fixtures and the vintage look of it. He keeps these old cash registers around. He pointed out that he had replaced the ice cream freezer. It had been a vintage Hershey's ice cream freezer, and of course he couldn't find that, so he had to replace it with something more contemporary, which he doesn't really like. When I made the model, I put in the old one, so I put it back. Hi, I'm Carmel Hines. I did work at Reddy's for 17 years behind that counter and I saw this on the Facebook and I just had to come over and see it tonight. It's just absolutely amazing. It looks just like it did when I worked there. The counter, the cereal boxes, and you know everybody in town what they eat from working there. And it looks just like it did. The, the way the counter is with the menus and the salt and pepper shakers, it's just amazing. I love this. Even the benches out front, one of these benches was a man that came in Reddy's for many years. A handicap man and they donated this one bench to him. Freddy was his name and everybody knew Freddy from Reddy's and I just got to know the whole town from working here. It's just really cool. It really is. I saw on Facebook that Phil did Reddy's Diner and uh, the detail and uh, the model. I had to get mine done. He said he was looking for another location in Ocean City so I got a hold of Phil and I asked if he would come out and look at our place. He chose to do us and we're very happy that he did and it turned out wonderful. So I went down to look at it, and it's a really unique interior. It's a great place. I've been there many times, next to the little Par 3 golf course in front of the airport. Phil told me that one day, Bill noticed some customers waiting outside, despite there being empty tables inside. He went out and said, folks, there's space to sit. They said, oh no, we're waiting for the booths. So Bill replaced many of the tables with booths. He also uses a wall of Coca-Cola cups near the front to separate the dining room from the kitchen. Both my wife Nancy and I have fond memories of taking our grandson there when he was little. I'd always pick him up so he could choose what kind of cereal he wanted for lunch. By the way, they also have wonderful omelets and blueberry pancakes. Phil's model is making my mouth water. 
could you walk me through the process? It starts with a visit to the diner, spend some time with the owner, just to make sure this is all going to be okay. And then it involves a number of hours and several visits to do all of my research. Preferably when it's closed, because otherwise it frightens the customers to have, <laughs> to have a person with a camera and rulers climbing all over the place. So I'll spend several hours just measuring everything. I work in half inch scale, means a half inch to a foot. So everything is made to exact scale, even down to the salt and pepper shakers. Draw out the floor plan, do all the measurements, draw all the pieces in place, make tons of little notes and margins of my drawings. And that's the first step. Then I photograph everything, so I have visual reference. All the materials, all the furniture, all the furnishings. That helps too with the location of things to have that visual reference. And anything that's on the walls, paintings, photographs, any graphics. I take straight on photographs of those so I can later put them on a computer and reduce them down to the right scale. I then send them to the local FedEx store who can print them out on clear label paper. So I can then affix them to styrene plastic, make little frames so you have an exact replica, <laughs> and put it back on the model where it should be. And then I have all that information. Then I have to go home and sit down and figure out, well, how am I going to make each little piece? I spend a lot of time in the hardware store going through all those little drawers and figuring out what's going to work, what's the right size. I use a clay called Sculpey, which comes in a variety of colors but can also be painted. I'm not a sculptor. One of the virtues of Sculpey is that it doesn't harden until you bake it, so you can keep working with it. I do not make the food. I found these two sisters in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, who make miniature accessories for dollhouses. They do make food in the appropriate scale. And that's mainly where I get the food. Explain how you do the tiles on the floors, the technique of that. Diners, especially the older ones, have a real specific kind of floor pattern and pattern and colors in the tile, and I try to get that as close as I can. Some of them are large enough. If it's a one-foot square tile, that's easy enough just to tape off and paint and then take the tape off and you have the pattern. If it's something that's more intricate than that or smaller tiles, which many of them are, one-inch tiles even, then I paint it as close as I can by hand. I get styrene plastic with the appropriate space grid and then paint it as close to the original as I can and use an X-Acto knife to scrape away the parts that need to be white. This is the Core Brothers frozen custard stand on the boardwalk at Moreland Terrace, right opposite the Music Pier. Are you a fan of this particular? Yes, yes. yes. This particular one and this particular custard. Is it nice to work at Core Brothers? Yeah, I like it. I think it's a really nice place to work in. And all the people is nice and it's fun to, to do the ice cream like that. And all the time like that. And yeah, I like it. I can see the, the sea and beautiful sunsets, that's all. <laughs> and where are you from? I'm from Spain. I usually get the chocolate with the chocolate dip. And I heard a rumor that your mother ate a gallon of that every day until she died in her early hundreds. Is that true? That's not true, John. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> Okay, maybe it wasn't the ice cream, but Phil's mother did make it into her hundreds. And it seems like family is a huge part of the Phil Jessica story. I am Phil's brother. What's your name? My name is Bill. How many of you Jessicas are there? My grandfather came from Hungary in 1906 with three kids and then had seven more here in the United States. And so we're third generation immigrant from Hungary. I'm the oldest, then Phil, then my sister Paula, and my younger brother Paul. Okay. Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Bill? Phil? Paula. Paul. Oh. <laughs> 
Do you speak any Hungarian? No, we don't. My sister knows a Hungarian nursery rhyme, <laughs> and she's the only one. The rest of us, they all assimilated, you know? Be American, learn English. Atandola Veshamora, on Tom Tigani, on Tom Tigani. That's all I know. I'm so proud of you. I had no idea it was that good. I love a lullaby. Phil, I knew you as my boss back at the Art Institute, and I do not recall you making models back 20 years or so ago. Well, first of all, using the term boss very loosely. <laughs> Let's clarify that. I always did art. Back in the 80s, I went to what was then called the Philadelphia College of Art as an evening student in illustration and design. I've always done illustration of some kind, but started making models about eight years ago. 2008, I made my first model, the Miss Worcester Diner, as a Christmas gift for my brother. It was just remarkable. We all exchanged gifts. Everybody was ready to move back to the dining room for desserts, the big moment of the night. And Phil said, wait a minute, there's one more gift. And it's for Bill and Marianne, my wife. And he brought out a big box and he said, be careful, it's a little fragile. And when I took off the lid, there was the diner we hung out in in college, an exact miniature to scale with the cook, with Marianne and I in a booth, she with her tea, we with my cheeseburger. Since Worcester is an old industrial city, it reminded me of the Harry Chapin song, A Better Place to Be. So I put the two characters from that song, the midnight watchman and the rotund waitress, I'm quoting, at the counter. And it's sort of a counterpoint to the young couple just found each other. And it was absolutely perfect. I'd always had it in my head to do something with the Miss Worcester Diner. It was his hangout at Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. We have family in Maine, so every time he would drive through Worcester, he would stop at the Miss Worcester Diner. So it was just part of his experience growing up and beyond. The Miss Worcester was trial and error from start to finish. I had never made a model other than model airplanes and stuff as a kid where you get a kit. And all my models were made from scratch. No kit, no plans, just start with an empty table and, and finish four months later with a finished model. A couple of years later, we put it in the car and we drove it up to the diner and showed the owner, who was absolutely flabbergasted. And it still looks the same. Just an incredible gift. I started with balsa wood. I can cut balsa wood with a utility knife. And then quickly learned you can't paint balsa wood, you can't stain balsa wood. <laughs> balsa wood curves when you try to glue it and things like that. So I figured out that basswood is the material to use and styrene plastic. So that's what I ended up with. How have you picked your subjects? We in Ocean City are flattered that you chose a lot of local venues. Well, early on, most of the models I made were made as gifts that related to the recipient. I'm Bill Gillespie, um, Phil Juska's nephew, and about five years ago, Phil made this for me. What I wanted to show, in addition to this diner that he and I used to go to when he was in college, I wanted to depict four stages of his life, tell that narrative using little figures that I made. When he was eight years old, his father passed away, and his father was a Philadelphia policeman. So I used the image from the Norman Rockwell painting, The Runaway, of the policeman sitting at a counter with a little boy and the counter clerk hovering over them. If you look through one of the windows in the model, you can see that exact tableau from that painting. On the other side of the counter, I put Billy and his friend Casey from college. Casey is now married to Billy's cousin, so they've continued <laughs> that. Uh, and then in one of the corner booths, I put Billy and me. I used to go up there to visit him, and we would go to the diner. This diner is famous for its large hamburgers. They make a 14-ounce hamburger. That's the only one you can get. Billy and I are eating our big burgers. Being a college student, he was typically hungover on the mornings we would go, so he's sitting in front of his half-eaten burger in the diner, and I'm sitting in front of my empty plate eating dessert just to taunt him a little further. According to Phil, the reason you couldn't finish those burgers is because you were hungover. 
Any truth to that? There are times when that was true. Not every time. Our last effort, the night before, I didn't go out. I didn't do anything the night before besides watch a show with my girlfriend at the time. I didn't order fries. I didn't put lettuce on top. I didn't put cheese on top. <laughs> I didn't even get tomatoes. And I still couldn't do it. And he would finish his own fries and then pick up mine if I had ordered them as well. So as much as he's taking a shot at me, <laughs> he was able to eat one and a half burgers plus my fries. So so there's a little bit judge. of the yeah. sin of gluttony. Yeah, here. that's right. That's right. You be the judge on, on that one. Yeah. <laughs> And then in the other corner is Billy and his wife, Terry, and their first child, Catherine. She was that cute little baby, huh? Yes. Oh, boy. You didn't even know how to read when you were a baby. <laughs> so it's kind of full circle from... How old is Billy now? Uh, 39. Doing pretty so, good? He's doing great. Yeah. So, That's... actually, cheer up. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, don't, okay. That's fine. This is the Harris Diner. I made it for my father, and that's him. About 10 years ago, my parents moved from their home in New Jersey to live with my sister in Owego, New York, which is near Binghamton. And my father quickly found the Harris Diner as his go-to place every morning. And they quickly became a part of the whole Harris Diner scene. How old is your father? At? He just passed away last month, oh. middle of May, at the age of 97. Wow. And my mother, who's also here, passed away about a year and a half ago at the age of 100. Good so. God, so you have quite a while. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> the owner, that's him cooking, Sam Harris, uh, is a big New York Yankee fan and New York football giant fan. So he has the entire place covered with Yankee and giant memorabilia and posters and photographs and all kinds of things. So I had to reproduce all of those in miniature to make it look exactly the same. Gillies is a lunch wagon, a lunch cart in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. For many, many years it was parked on the street. According to legend, it has the Guinness Book of Records world record for the most consecutive parking tickets. <laughs> so you get a ticket every day. And they've since pulled it into a permanent spot in a parking lot right off the main street in Portsmouth. But they left the truck attached that used to drive it around and they just put wood around the bottom to cover the wheels. So the wheels are still there, the truck is still attached, and this is all the bigger it is. It's got nine stools, there's space for the cook to stand. The cook in the model is Gilly, who worked there for many, many years, and that's why it's named Gilly's. I was there once with my older daughter after we had gone to a meatloaf concert in Portland, Maine. So I added she and I, and I also put meatloaf in the diner at the counter with his signature red scarf. In the song, Bat Out of Hell, he talks about driving away on his silver black phantom bike. And so I put that outside. My dad is absolutely amazing. It's <laughs> unbelievable what he can do. Now, did he give you one yet? No. What's My sister got one, one and I didn't. Uh, that's uh, okay. We better... I know. Get on him about that. Raise some holy hell about that. I think we should. <laughs> I think we should, definitely. We're a little miffed about that. I don't have a diner yet, and Ellie does. Did you guys meet John? No, maybe we should question it out. How come you, did, you didn't give your one daughter a diner? Uh, <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it. Oh, good. Okay, she doesn't working working Did you hear it. that? Yeah. I heard him loud and clear. And you're welcome, Sally. You should be receiving your diner shortly. Nighthawks is a two-dimensional painting. How did you work out how to do this in 3D? That was tricky. I just assumed that it was a real place. I tried to find pictures of it online. There's a ton of research of people who've tried to do the same thing. The conclusion most people have come to is that it never really existed. You can even see in the painting, it's on an odd angle. They pinpointed it down to several five-point intersections in Greenwich Village. I found a map of that neighborhood and identified the corner. If it had existed, this is the corner it would have been on. It was Hopper's neighborhood. 
So I was able to get the angle of the building from that map using my high school geometry. I could figure that out. I used the stools at the counter, and I know what the dimensions of a typical stool are in terms of height, the width of the seat, and the distance between one seat to the next, center to center. So using that information, I was able to extrapolate the dimensions of the entire rest of the building. I used photographs of coffee shops from the 1940s in New York City. And to be honest, I used the last drop coffee shop at 13th and Pine in Philadelphia (laughs) in my neighborhood because they had this beautiful oak back bar with the mirror and the columns. So that's what I used as my reference for, for the mirror. Phil told me that he worked in a diner growing up near Asbury Park and that he has always loved the photorealistic depiction of them by artists like Ralph Goings and Richard Estes. To Phil, there is a glamour in diners. This is Marlon Brando. He used to hang out in this diner when he was a young actor in Hollywood. So I put him at the counter in his costume from the movie The Wild One. Marilyn Monroe supposedly lived in this neighborhood as a young woman, so I made her the waitress. (laughs) (laughs) Any other celebrities in the... Yes, because it's in Hollywood and it's such an iconic looking place, it's been used in several episodes of The X-Files. Oh! So I have Scully and Mulder over here arguing. I believe in science, Mulder. (laughs) Scully, you gotta open your mind. And if you look closely in the kitchen window, you can see the smoking man lurking (sighs) in the background watching. I think I overheard you talking about some guy in drag. That was a commissioned piece. The gentleman wanted his beach house. I'd only done diners up to that point, but I thought, well, I could do a beach house. So I went to visit him and I took pictures and recorded everything in this beach house, which was a little converted garage with a bedroom and a porch added on. And he had it crammed with everything you can imagine. Photographs, paintings, the entire floor was different oriental rugs, ventriloquist dummies, artificial limbs from mannequins. You name it, it was in there. And I was able to reproduce about a third of that stuff. (laughs) I couldn't do everything. In each of the diners I had done, I included a narrative using little figures that I made to tell the story. And those were easy because I knew the people I was making them for. And I said, well, I want to tell a story, so tell me about it. He's owned this place for 30 or 40 years, so when he was a much younger man, he would have parties for his friends at the beach. And he just told me this story of a guy who came and he was in a flowing red dress and uh, at some point I I guess he'd been drinking too much but he fell out the screen door into poison ivy (laughs) in the backyard and she's still falling. This is a Pulsar for Hampton which is a version of a classic New England bay boat. The real Pulsar for Hamptons are all made by a guy named Dick Pulsifer in Brunswick, Maine. Mainly works by himself, completely by hand. This one is owned by a friend of mine, so I made a model of his Pulsifer Hampton boat. It's made completely from scratch, so I had to go online and learn Dick Pulsifer's strip planking technique so that I could do that in miniature. So you're kind of the Ginger Rogers to Dick Pulsifer's Fred Astaire. You do everything he does, but in miniature. Yes, like backwards and in heels. It's like, it's hard, yes. I'm sure it's much easier than what he does, (laughs) but... uh... It's a neat trick. By reproducing in exacting detail the places of our lives, Phil Jessica reaches our deepest selves through memory. And thus we shall end this film with a universal. Because truly, without miniature golf, life would be a barren wasteland. Oh, so close. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the diners and other things, I've made several miniature miniature golf courses. This one with a Philadelphia theme, Ben Franklin Bridge, Liberty Bell, City Hall Tower with William Penn on top, a Philadelphia soft pretzel, the Art Museum, 
with Rocky at the top of the steps. <laughs> the Indiana Love sculpture. Pat's and Geno's. They are rival cheesesteak places across the street from each other. So one side is Pat's, the other side is Geno's. You hit it in one side and it comes out the other. The Oldenburg clothespin and the Philly Fanatic. Having come to Ocean City for many, many years, we used to mainly play tea time golf down on the north end of the boardwalk. My sister-in-law and her husband, Marianne and Jim, rented for many, many years for a good part of the summer. And whenever anybody else in the family was here, their house was the focal point. I made this 18-hole miniature golf course for them as a Christmas gift a few years ago. There's a model of the house they rented for over 25 years. The beach they would go to, Second Street Beach. There's a wall of Miller High Life beers because that's Jim's favorite beer. <laughs> Lifeguard stand, Wonderland Pier, all the amusements. The annual baby parade. Mac and Mancos. At some point during the week, we would have the annual miniature golf tournament, and the winning team got to share the family cup. The rule is, if you are the winner of the cup, you have to prominently display it in your home. You can't hide <laughs> it, it behind go pictures. Right. It's got to go. Yes. So this is not a specific... This is out of my imagination, yes. Perhaps you could go into the miniature... I do that. I think my dream uh, <laughs> retirement job is to sit on the boardwalk in a little miniature golf course booth, and I'd be very happy doing that.